Welcome to the On The Fly, a Financial Literacy Institute podcast where our mission is to teach the financial literacy skills or who you should have learned in school. We cover financial basics, investing, business ownership, real estate, and everything in between. I'm your host, Inga, and I'm here with my co-host, Sean, and co-host, Zach, as well as our special guest and our first guest, Mr. Ryan Barker. Sean, Ryan, Zach, how are we all doing today? Excellent, brother. Thank you for having me. Yep. What's up, guys? Glad to be back. Yeah, doing well. Love to hear that voice. You know, um, Zach and Sean and I, we really want to thank you, uh, Ryan, for, you know, being a part of today. And because you're our first guest, it's going to be huge. We're going to have a lot of great conversations. And uh, again, you and I are part of a unique men's development group called The Standard, which we'll talk about later. But, uh, uh, and although we haven't met yet in person, I'm, I'm so glad to have this opportunity tonight to, you know, get to know you more. But I know how amazing, you know, this conversation is going to be. But before we get into that, can you kind of like tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely, brother. Um, so pleasure's mine. I think the big thing with the standard is just it, the, the most valuable thing about that group when we get into that is just the networking opportunity to meet other guys that are doing something cool. Like literally everybody in there is just up to something dope. So, um, you know, I'm definitely enjoying this too. And I'm glad to, and grateful to have the opportunity to network with you guys. But to answer your question, who the heck is Ryan Barker? Um, so <laughs> Ryan Barker, is one of those sort of engineering crosses finances sort of guys that has just been all over the place so i um was the guy who moved around when i was younger because my father actually was in the telecom space and had his company he was like a blue collar accountant for price waterhouse way back in the day and they collapsed and then a mentor in his professional literacy or professional environment got him into a fast track on a mid-sized telco that was being started by four guys around the kitchen table, right? And so he kind of really got to see that company grow and explode into what it is, which is now a very successful mid-sized telecom, which brought a lot of guys from the financial sphere as well as from the telecommunication sphere into my circle. And I remember being, you know, 12 years old, 15 years old, meeting with like executive directors at Morgan Stanley and um, you know, guys in my dad's industry, when I was 15 years old, I was bored over the summer. He was like, hey, you wanna go sweep floors? And I ended up going and working a tier three engineering job because I was that annoying kid that just wouldn't stop asking questions once I showed up, right? <laughs> and I had yeah. uh, my boss who was like this legacy Bell Atlantic guy who had been in the industry forever, just took a lot of interest in me, instilled a lot of work ethic. Then um, did a lot of moving around while my dad was getting established and that company was building itself over when I was younger, then went to college out of state. Clemson did a computer engineering undergrad uh, degree there. So kind of mixed electrical and computer science together for four years, which was a lot of fun. But I was one of those weird guys who went to college with kind of the vision and the goal in mind. Instead of like getting a degree to find a job, I was already five years into telecom at that point. Then I went and uh, decided like junior summer after junior year, I'm going to get in and try this Verizon thing and made the shift from small company culture to big company culture, which was a lot of fun. We can talk about that a little if you want to. Um, and then um, yeah, Verizon ended up recruiting me inside of that internship into a leadership development program where I rotated around just like my dad moved us around when we were younger. I rotated every six to 12 months for about five years all across the country, um, yeah, mostly in sectors of the Southeast, did Charlotte, did uh tampa did atlanta did houston um our corporate headquarters is up in basking ridge new jersey but it was interesting because i was like working on the ground level and engineering but then also the top level um with all the executives for like bi biannual business acumen trainings and that kind of thing so i kind of saw every hat that verizon had for me to wear i wore right from on the boots on the ground perspective and then i got to interact with their leadership chain then about 2018, they did a voluntary severance package where uh, suddenly, you know, we got a new CEO and the first thing he did is said, hey, we're going to try to try that, right? Well, what always happens with those, it's actually the opposite. And then a lot of the high, highly technical mentors that I had had in the company up to that point, I was probably three or four years in at that point, uh, decided to leave for greener pastures. And it left around a lot of the other guys who didn't necessarily, you know, not say anything bad about anybody, but you know, the, the, yeah. the kind of guys who weren't moving around because they couldn't get another job somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. And suddenly it was like going from being that guy that was the student of all these highly technical principal engineers across the company. Now I'm the most knowledgeable guy in the room, right? 
Mm-hmm. And then I went and, um, you know, continued that for a little bit. That created a lot of opportunity for me and Verizon decided they wanted to start this whole standardization initiative internally. Um, and I decided to jump on board on that. And then we're pulling all together the technical subject matter experts from across the company to say, hey, how can we get these 50 companies inside one big company all doing the same thing? And so that's what I do now. I'm principal engineer in Verizon doing networking um, and construction standards, basically dictating out how we do our cell site build flow. I continue to st- mentor students from a financial perspective, and I participate in certain groups like the one you mentioned. Love it. I love it. I love it. You know, and this it's beautiful because you mentioned something that actually leads into like a main question that I have for you, unless unless Zach and Sean, if you had a comment. No, no. Yeah, I got plenty okay. of questions, but Yinka, go ahead. Definitely. Yeah, no, this this is beautiful because, you know, Ryan already hit on to it. So you said, yeah, you studied computer engineering at Clemson, right? Yep. Yes, sir. OK, so knowing the type of guy you are, you're always, you know, thinking long term. Right. So and we have a lot of listeners who are college students, as am I. Um, or college students to be, right? So I think this would be really good for them to know. But can you talk about, you know, the things you had to sacrifice or even implement back when you were in college or even now in order to achieve your level of success? Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it's about taking the tangible action every single day. It's the biggest thing that I can tell you is going to make the difference for you, right? Because a lot of people in your age group are going to have all the ideas in the world but only 5% of those people are actually going to take the steps necessary to actually execute on those ideas. So I've got another good, good friend in my life who runs a personal training business. And one of the big things we always joke about him is he's kind of like a mindset coach because the real key to actually learning to be consistent with your fitness is your mindset, right? And one of the first ideas that we run people through inside of the back end of that business is this idea of, um, iteration, ideation, and execution, right? So the way the human brain is programmed, right? We're actually pretty simple creatures at the end of the day, right? And the thing that a lot of people, especially younger college students get caught up on, right? Is, is like the way we solve problems, right? We ideate, we figure out, think of a solution, right? Then the way we grow is we actually execute on that idea. And then we iterate and say, hey, what went well? What didn't go well? Whatever, right? Well, where a lot of people who are in that college space go wrong is they skip that execution step and they end up ideating and iterating on their ideas, right? And now you're solving problems that don't exist anymore and you're just spinning your wheels in circles, right? So what a lot of guys do wrong is they'll go in and they'll think, I could be this, I could be this, I could be this, but they never do any of it. So a lot of the reason my story worked out well for me is because I just threw myself in those situations and I didn't listen to my brain when my you know monkey brain was like, oh, I don't know if I'm qualified to do this or whatever. It was like, yeah. I don't care. I'm going to just go do it and try it, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, Verizon, and the thing is, is the more you do that and the more you actually practice, you know, rejecting that voice in your head, the easier it gets actually, for sure. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys, you know, it's very intimidating, like, oh, Verizon's got this whole laundry list of bullet points and I meet three of them on this job opportunity. Oh, I don't care. Well, you know, what you don't know in the back end is there was some HR recruiter somewhere that wrote this um, and took some, you know, half written email from some hiring manager who's trying to get some talent together and took their you know, eight games of telephone later came up with what you see there through five different people, right? And when actually you meet the guy who's looking for somebody, he's just looking for thing one, thing two, thing three, and you either know those things or you can pick up those things, right? So I think the thing is, is you just have to be the one to bring the confidence into the interaction when you find a new opportunity to say, yeah, I want this and I want to go for it and just see where that road leads you is the biggest thing, right? And if you're willing to do that, you will get where you want to go. And right, so too, I think the other trap that people fall into on your ideation and iteration is they, they may slightly get past the iteration to actual execution, but they'll only execute for a very short time. And then they decide, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go to the next thing. So they're basically like starting to starting to build. And I hear this in the Bigger Pockets podcast all the time. They talk about you start to build a bridge, but you're going to build 10 other bridges at the exact same time. So you have 10 partially finished bridges and zero completed bridges. And I think that's kind of an issue that we all fall into. Definitely. That's something I fall into 100%. 
I do that to myself today all the time. And you have to check yourself and really be hold yourself accountable in those situations because it's very easy, especially us. Um, you know, people like to say engineers aren't creative. That's a lie. We just kind of manifest that creativity in different ways. And what you're talking about is, you know, how it comes out sometimes. It's like you look and the, the thing I like to say about engineers, we get addicted to every potential solution, right? Well, the yeah. risk about that is if you're constantly thinking of what's potential, right? You're never actually going to realize something 100% of the way. It's very easy to do 10 things 10% of the way instead of one thing 100% of the way. Which is why I just, you know, I always stress to people, you have to execute completely before you iterate, right? If you don't give something your all, then you can't really say that you tried it. Mm, I love that. I love it. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, even just like some nuance there with what, you know, Zach loves to talk, talk about, which is so true. Just like be there. Just, you know, I think I know you mentioned that earlier. Just take opportunities. Just, you know, the the the, the quote is you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. Right. You, you, know, you need to take those shots. So, so to all of our listeners out there, exactly what Ryan was talking about, like even with the little interview option or the, the application, like you, you it might seem daunting that you're not hitting all these bullet points, but just try it. You never really know. Just try it. Just try it. And when you find something that you're really good at, Go 100% of it. Don't just, again, like Ryan was saying, don't find 10 things. You're doing mediocrely 10% while you're not actually executing. Execute on that one thing, focus, and just let that come to fruition. I love that. Great advice, Ryan. Beautiful. Yeah. And the thing you got to look at too, you're at a very unique age where there's never going to be more opportunity in your life than there is right now, to be frank, right? You can go do 800 things and fail at 799 of them and be just fine. Right. And that's a really beautiful thing through my story at Verizon. I've done a million different things. I've stuck with two companies in my entire corporate career. Right. But I've worn a bunch of hats. I've been the guy doing the telco, um, like the voice um, over IP telco, like support technician that they call at 3 a.m. when a line has gone down. I've been the transport guy um, managing the microwave dishes deployments. I've been the construction guy actually building cell sites. I've been the call tester, literally driving around in a Chevy Traverse with an antenna through the backwoods of Virginia, trying to figure <laughs> out where the signal's strong and where we need to build more sites, right? And the wow. thing is, is, you know, a lot of that has been a lot of crazy stories and a lot of fun times. But honestly, if I listened to all of the voices in my head that said, I can't, I wouldn't even be able to tell you half of those stories, right? Not all of those things panned out. I learned through a lot of those experiences, like, Hey, I never want to work an outage job again because I enjoy sleeping at 3 a.m., right? <laughs> or whatever it might be. Uh, right. But, you know, all of that was just in part, part of my journey and important part of my growth. And I don't regret a single bit of it, right? You're going to learn mm -hmm. so much when you go on your own journey and you're going to have your own crazy story to tell people. That's going to be beautiful at the end of the day. Love it. Thank you for that. That's beautiful, Ryan. Gotcha. All righty. What do you guys got for the second question? Unless I got something. So, Ryan, okay, so when you, I guess, let's start this from a younger age. Like when you were a kid in junior high and high school, did you always know that you wanted to be an engineer, that you always wanted to work in something financial related? Or what were your thoughts at that age? Yeah, um, the finance was more like medicine that was kind of spoon fed down my throat, whether I wanted it or not. But my dad put me in front of the right people, basically. And then really in college is when I, really kind of figured that whole thing out. Um, we bought a apartment for my last two years to live off campus. And I actually, um, or it wasn't an apartment, it was a condo. And then we owned, uh, I owned it and I managed all the finances for it. I collected rent. I did all the maintenance and stuff like that. Um, this is actually my first house that I'm talking to you in. So it was great prep work for all of that. Um, and then I was doing investing as early as 18 when I was legally able to do that because of some of the context of my dad's network. So that's kind of how I picked up on that. But from the engineering perspective, I would say, yeah, I always had an inkling and an idea that I wanted to do something with technology. Was it specifically telecom initially? No, not really. I just knew that I loved computers and trying to rip things apart and figure out how they work and put them back together. You know, I just buy stuff, tear it apart, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I was, I remember being four years old in my mother's dial up connection, um, you know, Windows XP 1995 computer and just trying to, you know, get inside and out of that thing. And it was just always like that with me for technology. And so 
the opportunity to go work at my dad's company came up and at first it was very informal. It was literally like, Hey Ryan, go uh, just get these guys coffee and sweep the rug and stay out of the way. Right. Basically. <laughs> but it would be good for you to be around for these guys. You know, you'll, you'll absorb value through osmosis. Right. Right. <laughs> um, right. And, and I think there is something to be said, by the way, for putting yourself in the right environments too. I'm a big, huge believer in the manifesting successful environments around yourself. If you want to grow. Um, growth conducive environments are absolutely huge, but yeah, um, no, it, that's how it started. And then really, you know, it only really kicked off and I only really got as committed to it because my boss at that time, you know, just noticed me kind of noticing one of the task plans on the side of the um, desk and messing with the video phones, pressing the button. Hey, Ryan, Ryan, what are you doing or whatever? Right. Um, it's like, oh, I'm just trying to figure out how this works. That's really neat. And kind of noticed that I was actually kind of getting it for a 15 year old kid and you know, the uh, tier three telecommunications laboratory, right? <laughs> just mm -hmm. messing around with this thing. He's like, oh, well, let me teach you this or that. And this is Wireshark and how you trace stuff. And, you know, it just started as like informal little lessons as I'd show up and he's like, oh, well, I'd love to have you on the team. And then by the end of the uh, summer that I was there, I was running test plans for him and it just kind of accelerated from there. That's, that's awesome. That's a great yeah. story. Yeah, that's thank super you for cool. That. So Ryan, it sounds like you got, you know, always a lot going on uh, at any given time. So is there a method you have to uh, kind of keep your, keep the blinders on and, and keep focused on, like you said, the things that are important and not, you know, get overwhelmed or as Yinka was saying, build too many bridges at the same time? 100%. So my biggest thing is boundaries, guys. Boundaries are so, so freaking important. So at these days, you know, and what I've done especially trying to gear up and really with me for fitness is where I learned this lesson in my life more than anything else. So the thing is like, I had kind of gotten into fitness in college, um, in undergrad, I had met a guy my sophomore year who was a random match roommate, who was just one of those guys that was just super gym rat, a uh, little short five foot four guy, but just super <laughs> stout. Um, one of those dudes that just like lifted for pure mass. So you'd show up to the gym with him and you just do concentration curls for like five hours, just down there on the bench. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's the one who kind of instilled the habits in me initially. And then I worked with a few PTs as I was moving around for all the job stuff that I told you about. Right. But the thing is, is I kind of, I looked at my fitness as transactional versus non-negotiable um when i was younger right so i kind of saw all my increasing responsibility with what i was doing academically what i was doing for verizon and i kind of went and reasoned in my head and it was like oh well you know i'm spending all my time and energy and putting all my discipline and positive character traits into these things now which means i can't put them into my health right and then it turns into like oh well this person needs my time or that person needs my time or i got to get on this call or do that right and before you know it, your consistency and your uh, nutrition, your fitness just starts falling off the wayside and you're going, you're saying, oh, I can't eat this or I you know, can't cook tonight because I've got to um, get on this call tomorrow, whatever. And you're not taking care of yourself anymore. And then it just becomes instead of like, you know, looking at your nutrition as fuel for your body, you start looking at it like, how do I make this convenient? Right. Uh, for example, and that's when it just really falls off the wayside. And then it's like, oh, I'll get fast food today or I'll Uber Eats tomorrow or whatever. And then it's just like, oh, well, now I'm not hitting my macros. Well, now I'm gaining a bunch of weight. Like, you know, when I did that rotational program for Verizon, I gained 40 pounds, guys. Um, yeah, so I was right about 200, 210 foot. And between there today, I'm, you know, 160, 165, right? Uh, and it, it got to this thing where it just kind of compounded in the negative direction where it was just like, I didn't think I could turn it around, but I knew the entire time I wasn't living up to my full potential because I knew what I used to lift. I remembered being eight and a half percent body fat that entire time. It was like, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. And so the thing is, is like what you have to do for yourself, if you really want to manifest anything in your life, whether it's professional goals, finances, fitness, right. You've just got to go in and zero in on what are the daily habits that are going to consistently get you there and then intentionally block out your time to say, I'm going to do these things. And it doesn't matter if the world's at fire at work. It doesn't matter, you know, if things are great or if things are low, right. I'm going to take care of me so I can serve other people. Because the thing is, it's like a lot of people fall in this trap of trying to serve people, but their cup themselves is not full, right? Right. The thing is, if you can't serve people with the water you need to survive, 
you have to fill your cup. If you want to be a man of service, that means you need to be taking care of yourself by default if you want to be able to make it through that. Okay. That's just a prerequisite to that situation. If you can't, you know, check off your own boxes, you have no sense trying to show up for other people because you are just going to serve yourself short every single day and you're not going to be around in the long term and you don't want to be that person. So true. That's so cool do you that. think, do you think too that we almost have to have a little bit of selfishness in ourselves to make sure we take care of ourselves in order to properly serve, like you said? I think so. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily look at it necessarily as like I'm being selfish by doing that. I think you're being selfish when you try to show up at 10% when you could show up at 100%, right? Mm -hmm. um, to a certain degree. Uh, I think, and that's really how I try to look at it is like when I want to show up for somebody else, do I want that person to get, you know, 5% of Ryan? Do you know Ryan on a bad day? Or do you want that person to get Ryan firing off at full cylinders, right? If that means I have to go block out my schedule and say, I'm going to work out these two hours in the morning and I'm not taking work calls these two hours in the morning, right? Period. It doesn't matter what's going on. You'll see me at 10 a.m. or whatever it is, right? And you'll see me at 10 a.m. and you just have to stick to that. I mean, I remember and there are little things you can do for yourself to enforce some of those decisions once you've done that. For instance, like your calendars will often let you do like auto declines and that kind of thing that you can set up. Mm -hmm. I did that initially, actually, for my job after five years of just showing up and accepting every meeting invite. I put an auto decline for like three hours in the mornings. Um, I work with a lot of folks on the West Coast. So what I did is I said, hey, I'm going to work West Coast hours on the East Coast. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so I'm going to work West Coast hours on the East Coast. So you'll see me starting at 11 a.m. and I'll start, you know, work my 40 hours basically, right, um, until about 8 p.m. at night. And so 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., I just had that auto decline for my gym time. And it literally said, I'm in the gym. I'll catch you at 11, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I got, I remember the first week I did that, just hundreds of pings from people like, oh, my God, I need you here or there or whatever, the world, whatever. But then I just didn't show up and I was congruent and I backed my words with my actions, which is so, so huge, guys. You have to follow yeah. through on what you say. But yes. if you do that, then people will learn and people will adapt. And now it's no big deal, right? But I think a lot of people get um, get caught up in the trap of not enforcing their own boundaries because they're worried about what other people, how other people react. But the thing is, is the reason other people react negatively is because you're not being congruent with yourself. And, you know, other people are very, very good at spotting that. Right. They're, they're not mm -hmm. going to respect somebody who doesn't even respect themselves. hundred thousand percent. Wow. And even just what you said, like I know Sean mentioned, like started the question with selfishness. But like you, Ryan actually transcended that into selflessness because you're doing that, yes, on the front end, but on the back end, they're getting 100% Ryan. Ryan on four cylinders, just going, that's beautiful. I love that and I could not agree more. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. So, you know, I, uh, like I mentioned probably a little bit earlier, is that I recently again attended your amazing and informational financial roadmap event that you had with the standard a few weeks back. And, you know, for those, for our listeners who don't know who the standard is, what the standard is, and maybe who like the founders of the standard are, can you talk about that a little bit as well as at a high level, uh, maybe a little bit of your financial roadmap presentation? Absolutely. So when I was rotating all over the world for Verizon, I landed in the small town of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And this was about 2018 timeframe. And while I'm getting going in Atlanta, Georgia, I start getting all these local YouTube recommendations for kind of what's <laughs> going on in Atlanta, Georgia, right? And right. I see this channel, because normally like, I had been in and out of the YouTube culture and the manosphere or whatever you want to call it these days. And most, at, at that point had by and large checked out of the whole red pill thing. I had some personal experiences in college that just weren't very congruent with that. And I learned some of the harsher lessons you learn in that sphere through some of those experiences. And that was really, you know, four or five years before any of that really was huge on the internet. And, right. you know, all of it was blowing up. So I was just like, I was never really drinking the Kool-Aid online when it came to that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. then I see, you know, you, know, you have entrepreneurs in cars and all these other guys that have been doing this kind of thing forever. And I see in there, there's this little local channel called The Roommates, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, met by these two guys who just have an incredibly phenomenally mature message that is just such a change of pace. 
from everything else you find in that sphere, right? You yeah. see, they're talking dating, they're talking masculinity, they're talking all of these things that all these other channels talk about, but then they go and they hit it from such this mature, just breath of fresh air outlook. Like, no, there's accountability on both sides of this equation. It's like, holy crap, I've never seen the internet actually acknowledge the A word in that fashion, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like joint accountability, this is an idea that exists, right? right? right. Um, and I just really fell in love with the message that they were spreading through that channel and platform. And so I got going and just kind of kept watching. And I was that annoying guy in the YouTube comments that would just kind of share my thoughts on things. Right. And so I just okay. got into this model where I would just write response to these videos like, oh, I think this or that or whatever. And had a little bit of back and forth with the creators and that kind of thing. But I didn't know anybody at that point. Well, um, 2019 rolls around and they decide that on their channel, they're going to go and do YouTube lives. Right. And on YouTube live, they go through and they, um, start doing like an unfiltered show where it's like, Oh, it's going to be the creator, but he's going to do the spicy opinions or whatever, and do a little bit of an entertainment sort of shtick to the normal stuff. So, you know, he still has the mature core values that I talked about, but we're going to add a little bit of an entertainment component to this now. Right. And so because of that, you know, when you get into something like that or uh, the Kevin Sham Samuels show, which, by the way, rest in peace, Kevin Samuels, that was uh, super, super yeah. unfortunate. Um, yeah. yeah, you're going to get that kind of interesting crowd from the Internet that pulls in that you attract the attention of there. And so, of course, he needed some moderators. Right. And mm -hmm. so I would just kind of go initially. I just watched that show as a viewer and I was just going back and forth with the moderator that he had in there at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Um who was just this guy uh it's, it's like christopher mcknight or something like that as i found out it was not actually his name um, okay uh just one of those random online screen name aliases but we went back and forth and it was funny because everybody thought he was chris Bilo, one of the co-stars on the show um right. and that was the funny joke is like chris but not actually chris um mm, okay. so we go back and forth a little bit and talk and we just became good friends right uh, and then he vouched for me and then I ended up starting mod moderating for Hafiz, right? And then I yeah. had basically this whole 10 year situation in my personal life blow up with this chick from college and the, she dated my roommate and there was a whole triangle thing involved oh, and it kind of okay. culminated and blew up in my face five years later when I never even thought I was going to deal with it again because she ended up, you know, being a medical resident at a hospital five minutes down the road for me five years after we had graduated college and that, you know, it, it was one of those books you thought was closed, but then life <laughs> like psych, right. And uh -huh. it shows right back up and it blew up. Okay. Well, at the time, the fees on this channel was doing these sessions, right. Where you could pay a right. couple hundred dollars to show up and talk to him through any issue basically. And he hit you with it. His guarantee was he'd hit you with a tangible solution or whatever. And I was just at a really low point because I had, been moving all around and, you know i've had all this success in my life and all these great things that have happened for sure but you know the the personal component of that is difficult i'm not going to lie to you guys when you're constantly moving every six to 12 months or five years after a while it's just like putting the social energy out there to like i'm going to go meet people and i'm going to build my network and i know i'm going to walk away from them as soon as i get to know somebody that's tough to do after a while you just kind of go yeah. mm. and that's kind of where i was at and then this girl shows up and then she's not the same girl i met at 18 right and it blew up and there were just a lot of that that was an emotional moment for me basically right um and so then i i had known hafiz a while and i had seen what hafiz had talked about in regards to like the dating the masculinity thing and it was like i need an accountable man that i can just talk to in a circle of good guys around right um mm -hmm. And so I talk, I called a fees and I was like, you know, screw it. I'm going to talk to this guy and just see what happens. Right. Um, and so we talked through that whole situation and I just said, yeah, I mean, man, the, th the thing is, it's just, it's tough because I remember being in college, I had all these guys around me, you know, your whole social group of everybody who's trying to do the same thing as you that's in your age group, going through the same challenges as you that, you know, it's like, that just disappeared after I graduated. Right. <laughs> and then it's just like me doing my thing for forever. Um, mm -hmm. and he's like, yeah, I'm always trying to figure out how to create that sense of community for guys. Right. But that session right. is really what got me and Hafiz very connected. And we stayed in touch after that point. 
And then he invited me down to a Dallas live show that he was doing for that podcast at the time um, at the end of last year. And he announced right. the show like, hey, I've been really trying to figure out how to solve this community problem for men because I think there's a lot of driven individuals that have gone their own past just because of the sacrifices they've had to make. How do I bring them together to give them a place where they can kind of culminate, share ideas, grow together and be the best versions of themselves? You know, time collapse, compound from everybody's lessons and really just skyrocket. Well, I want to create this brand, the standard for the men that are serious and I'm going to pull everybody in. Yeah, you, know, you can go and buy this suit to gain access to the community. And then we're going to do, you know, quarterly networking events. And we're going to do these monthly mentorship sessions and, you know, perception and economics and have guys from the community actually contribute back to the community doing these masterclass Mondays where somebody like Ryan, who knows finance, is going to come up and spit financial game. And then somebody like Aaron, who knows fitness, is going to teach nutrition and fitness. And then, um, you know, you could have somebody like Joe hit you with all the style and the fashion tips, whatever, and just really elevate guys. And that was the inspiration for the idea. So if he's, you know, it's about six months old at this point, um, but it's really just blown up. Right. And I think uh, they're onto something very, very big there. They're filling a gap in the space that just does not exist anywhere else, I think. And I'm just super excited and super thankful to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I love that because I have a very similar story and I can really relate to everything you just mentioned. And that is exactly why I joined it as well. And I definitely, it's like you said, it's only been um, up for six months and I wasn't part of the standard 100. I just joined in uh, April and I've already like, again, just seen the fruits of the labor that all these guys are putting in. Again, it was all on the back end, but now like, you know, Hafiz talks about like, this is the justice league. We're all doing this together as men. We're, we're killing it in the game. And through this, met you you're on this podcast today like that's exactly what these things do and you know networking mentoring you and Hafiz all these kinds of things absolutely amazing and like you just mentioned you know a lot of what these guys do is that they bring a lot of their special talents to the standard and again what you did which was that financial roadmap a couple weeks back I learned a ton from you so yeah again if you're able to set a quick high level like what do you think are some like high level again tips and tricks for our listeners out there who are again like college students or just you know newly grads yeah, so inside of Hafiz's entire brand, but especially the standard, we have four different pillars of um, what makes the best version of the, you know a man the best version of himself, right? That's going to be emotional growth, spiritual growth, financial growth, and physical growth, right? right so right. if you're looking to optimize any of those four pillars, which again, physical growth, financial growth, emotional growth, or spiritual growth, there is no better place or community on the internet you can go to than the standard, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to tell you that, you know, it's a golden treasure trove where you're going to find all the answers to solve out all your problems in your life. But I mean, if you're looking for a community and network of guys that are at your level, trying to get there and push it to the next level, and you need that driver ambition to keep you going and keep you sustained, there is no better place to be. So I'm a big proponent of finding mentors and I wouldn't necessarily consider like the community of guys and Hafiz, uh, Hafiz's community as mentors as I would more peers, right? But I think it's right. really important to have both in uh, your life. I think if you lose those peers that are trying on the grind with you, it's very, very easy to run into sustainability issues and want to burn out. And, you know, that's where I was at before I really dived into this for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. No, huge into accountability. I love that. Go ahead, Sean. And I think too that just your, your your quick overview of the standard was a phenomenal sales pitch. And as someone who's not involved with it, it inspires me to get involved with it. So thank you for that. Yeah, You're me welcome. as well. I have not uh, been involved or really uh, hip to what standard is. So uh, that's definitely something I'm going to look into now for sure. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk 100%. <laughs> but yeah, no, again, if, if you're able to, again, again, I got that high level for just for like a couple of minutes, just uh, because again, you are like that financial guru, one of them, if not like the guy in the standard. So what again, for just college students, high school students, anybody who again, roughly our age, what is something or some things you're able to kind of uh, give as advice financially for, for their listeners? Absolutely. So what you have to really realize, especially if you don't have a lot of financial literacy education, is that the entire world is going to be caught up on the bet next biggest fad always right so for a while when i got out of college it was just like this whole GameStop stock thing that was happening right 
And then after that, it's like, oh my God, we got blockchain now. Everybody's got to get into blockchain. And then now, oh, crypto. Well, now Web3 after that. Now, oh, NFTs, because we can make pictures while we do this, right? Or mm -hmm. whatever. And the thing about that is it's what you got to realize is whatever the market hype is following is not generally what you want to be doing with your money if you want to um, go through and set yourself up for long-term success. So if you want to look at your long-term vision, the best thing you can do for your financial portfolio is diversify into high um, equity appreciating assets, right? So what I'm talking about there are uh, assets in your portfolio that may not necessarily be the sexiest initially, right? You're, but they're consistent, right? So if I can see long-term steady state growth, if you go look at a compound interest calculator online, just Google a compound interest calculator and you see what it takes with $10,000 over a 40 year period, you'll end up with $1.8 million, like a 2% appreciation rate. And a lot of these index funds and ETFs can get you in at you know, eight to 10% appreciation year over year, right? So the thing is, is what you wanna do with your money if you're starting from small um, scratch, right? Is A, identify where your debts in your portfolio are, right? and figure out how to knock those out, right? You don't necessarily have to be 100% debt-free if you can get a low interest rate debt. But I'm a big believer in making sure that your portfolio is operating at that less than you know 3% interest rate on your debts if you can get there, just to make sure they're not killing it, um, killing your portfolio and that you're still netting more appreciation in the long term than you are in um, you know appreciating debt, depreciating debt, right? Uh, and then from there, it's just about building a solid financial base. So, you know, goal number one I give everybody is, hey, give yourself a budget, right? Make yourself a roadmap and figure out where the heck your money is going. And a lot of people tell you to make a budget, but I think the biggest thing that people get wrong there is you have to practice disciplined principles with your budget, which means there's no such thing as flex dollars in your budget. So, you know, Yik is a good looking guy. I'm sure he goes on a lot of dates, right? So the thing yeah, about you know. that, is you don't have to budget every single date you go on week over week, right? But if you know you're going to be going out on dates, you better have a line item in your budget for your dates that you right. know is going to be averaged out at a certain amount that you know, like it's a known quality quantity. It's not an unknown flexible amount in your budget because that's how money gets overspent and that's how you run out of surplus. And really the name of the game in the beginning is creating that surplus, which is the money that's left over after you service all your expenses in the month from the income that you take plus, which is what's going to allow you to make those big money moves. And you can start real small with that. Just put it in a high yield savings account at first, right? And just go get an Ally Bank or a Goldman Sachs account, right? Go start compounding that um, in that high yield savings account for a couple months and just pocket that money and have it right there. When you cross six months worth of expenses, I'm a big proponent of opening a new savings account at that point versus continuing to, um, put deposits in that old one. Well, now guess what? That one with six months, that just became your emergency fund and you never touch that, period. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is, now you have a psychological barrier between that account and everything else in your portfolio. So you don't mm -hmm. tie any automatic expenses to it. You just keep it old school in that account. And that money is just there. It's your bucket for a rainy day where you need that money, right? Mm -hmm. But then all your other surplus can go other places in your portfolio. Then you can start looking at things like stocks. You can look at things like your 401k and the passive income that you literally can get free money, guys, by asking your employer the right questions, right? You get a 401k match benefit. It is so, so huge. Ask about your 401k, please, right? Yes. Um, and you can go from there. But really, the idea is just get your money in these index funds and ETFs that are good going to just appreciate at that 8 to 12% interest rate, buy and hold those things. Time in the market always beats time in the market. I promise you, even when the market's at a recession, you will net positive um, yeah. over the time period and, you know, just, you know, buy, hold, and you're going to be good. And then when you have those assets in your portfolio for, you know, five, seven years, you're going to start seeing return. I promise you, right? And when that return starts coming in, that's when you can start getting flexible with some of the money coming in. Because what you're going to find is that your money is now compounding faster at a rate much faster than your income. Like my wealth, my net worth is not growing because of my income increasing. I mean, my income is increasing and I make over six figures and it's great. Don't get me wrong. But ultimately, a lot of what I've done and the reason that I'm financially stable right now and financially free is because of my stocks and my brokerage accounts and uh, a lot of these longer term higher 
uh, yield appreciating assets that exist in my portfolio. That's really what's contributing to my net worth. It's just those assets compounding. But you've got to look at it like a muscle, right? So it's like, I can't just show up to the gym and bench 225 after being out for eight months. It doesn't work that way. I've got to build momentum, right? Which means, you know, I can crawl, then I can walk, then I can run, right? It's beautiful. Yeah, and just one thing I want to say on that. And kind of see how, oh, yeah, just, like, okay, go ahead. Um, I think if, if there's one thing that we can take away from, you know, this episode, it's time in the market beats timing the market every single time. Like, if you remember one thing, just remember that. I like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, you know, one thing I can really attest to is that Ryan is so transparent again in this, in this, uh, in this presentation two weeks back, it was amazing. You know, he he's he's on the route to become a millionaire, probably in the next, you know, less than 10 years. Like you're 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 there. So this man is spitting facts. Every all of our listeners, listen to Ryan. If you're not gonna listen to us, listen to Ryan. But this is exactly what we teach at FLI. That it's all about the fundamentals, all about the 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 simplicity and the basics of you know, just putting money away, you know, spending less than you make, time in the market beats timing the market, budget. It's the simple thing. It's not gonna be the sexy things. It's not always gonna be the sexy, it's rarely gonna be the sexy things. Those are the one-off things, the game stops, all these kinds of things. No. Keep it to the basics and with consistency over time. And again, it will work with compounding and compounding and compounding effects. So I love that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But Ryan, again, an absolutely amazing conversation we had today. And I mean, I knew we were going to have it because I just I just knew you radiated that energy coming from the standard like you. We we all like we said that standard, and I love that. But, um, you know, where where can uh, where can people find you, whether it's, you know, social media or connect with you? Where, where can people where, where can our listeners find you? Absolutely. So my tags across social media are generally going to be RC Bark. It's a little weird. So it's R as in Ryan, C as in Charles, and then Bark is in my last name, B-A-R-K-E, but no R at the end. OK, uh, perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Again, big thanks to my guy, uh, Mr. Ryan Barker, for coming on today. We at FLI very much appreciate you. You have no idea. And uh, before we kind of give out that outro, anything from Zach and Sean, what you guys got? Ryan, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, we got a good, a lot of good uh, knowledge and wisdom out of you. I like time in the market beats timing the market. Uh, we got ideate, execute, and iterate. Uh, two great little sayings to live by. Uh, thanks so much. Love it. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, it was it was great to get to know you through this podcast episode. And shout out to Yinka for connecting us together. Um, mm -hmm. I look forward to talking some more in the future and getting involved in the standard. But 100%, mm -hmm. everything that you went over today is easily applicable. And it doesn't take, you know, $100,000. It doesn't take um, a degree in finance, any of that to actually apply it. You know, you might have to do an hour of research online, learn how to make a budget, learn what a 401k is, learn what an IRA is and how to actually set up an account. But from there, it's easy and you just set up automatic withdrawals, automatic transactions, and it just happens for you. So this this is it it doesn't take, you know, an engineer at Verizon to do this stuff. It doesn't take, you know, any of us to do it. Any anyone, whether they're, you know, a high school senior or a college kid or someone in their 30s, it's all possible no matter what standpoint you're at. It just takes discipline. 100%. Yeah. And we're engineers, like we we love to be efficiently lazy at the end of the day, right? So when I talk <laughs> about like my 401k, I have that set up at a 6% match because that's what my company offers for me. I have an automatic contribution set up from my paycheck. It just takes right out. It already spreads into four or five index funds that I've already picked out at a certain contribution rate. That 401k runs itself. I haven't messed with that other than the contribution rate when I was buying my house a couple of years back, right? But otherwise, this thing just literally runs itself and it just compounds. It's probably got about $100,000 in it at this point. Beautiful. And that's the thing you got, you know, guys, you, you set yourself up now. And as Ryan is saying, as Sean is saying, as Zach is saying, as I, like you do it now and you're, you're set up. Like you just, just set it up now with time, consistency. You'll see those gains. It's consistency. It's time. You'll see it. It's absolutely inevitable. But nonetheless, we want to thank all of you for listening to On The Fly, a Financial Literacy Institute podcast. If you'd like to learn more, check us out at www.thefli.net and our Instagram at the Financial Literacy Institute. We look forward to joining for, for you all to join us on our next episode as we teach the financial literacy skills that we should have learned in school. Love it.